Okay, so all my renders are, are done and now I'm going to organize everything in, a, in my Photoshop documents to make my life easier in the future. So, I'm going to import everything. So this render with the water, I, I rendered it only at full, at uh, 2K wide because uh, I mostly need the, uh, the color pass only. So this is my main render. I'm going to import my ID pass. So I have a very specific organization now that I came with the time. It doesn't mean that I have to, to use the same, it works for me. It helped me to, to uh, keep in mind where everything is. So I, I'm separating every piece of rendering in a specific folder that have its own name. So I'm, I'm going to put all, every, Every render pass that is related to the light in a group that I'm going to call lighting. And I used to put this group in hard light mode. And underneath I'm going to add a 50% gray, which is going to neutralize the uh, diffusion mode. So basically, hard light on top of a 50% gray doesn't do anything. And what I like about this organization is that it lets me have my local colors in a separate folder. And I can use every kind of fusion mode in this folder here to create my local colors. So basically, a hard light on top of a, another uh, layer does exactly the, the, the opposite than having the same in a way that having this this uh, layer here in normal mode with this group here on top of it on overlay mode so it, it does the same so you can you can either having this group in overlay on top of this of this lighting pass or you can do the opposite. I, I like to organize things this way because it makes sense for me as I started to, to learn digital art uh, by 3D and I, I, I spent quite a lot of time to learn about rendering because I rendering and lighting. I was very really enjoying this part. So I, I'm trying to organize my file in the, in the same way that a 3D renderer would uh, would work in a way so i'm trying to have my my local colors which are my diffuse in a way then my lighting and on top of it of it i'm i'm going to uh, add some more value and color variations because there is there is only so far that you can obtain some colors in in this way there there is like some some color combinations that can't exist using a hard light group so most of the time I'm, I'm adding another layer on top of it, another group where I'm going to use like multiply and color burn and overlay again to obtain some more color variations. Yeah, so I'm going to import some of my fundamental passes like this one. The, um, normal pass. which I often use just to quickly select some faces orientation or just to create some some fake random color variations not random at all actually but just to to bring some uh, some variety in the in the lighting yeah. another important pass is the depth pass so the depth pass is a is a 32 bit pass so it always, most of the time, come, uh, comes at, as a white, pure white like that. So you need to import it separately in Photoshop and use uh, the exposure adjustment layer. 
and then with some levels I'm going to uh, just try to obtain exactly the value range that I need in, uh, in 8 bits. So the great thing about working in 32 bits is that it's actually non-destructive. So you can you can crush your values like that, and then if you start to use uh, another exposure, and, uh, yeah, you can you can get back some of these values again. So it's 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 really interesting, but unfortunately there is like too much um, Photoshop uh, native. Uh, Native functionality that doesn't work in uh, in 32 bits. So I'm just using it to quickly obtain um, a coherent usable value pass, depth pass. Let's say it's okay. So I'm going to flatten everything. Convert it to 8 by 8 bits. Ctrl R, Ctrl C, Ctrl W to close. And I'm going to add this into a separate channel. Because now that I have my base composition, I'm not going to paint anything by hand. Uh, at least I don't want to change any edges until I have um, a very, very close to final color and values combination. So now I'm really going to composite every, every passes I have maybe paint a bit by hand in the shapes themselves. But uh, yeah, it's only at the very end that I'm going to start to really paint and, and mess with the edges and add details and so on. Because uh, it's, it's going to, to make my life easier to really keep this for the end. This way I'll be able to, to use the full uh, potential of the 3D rendering that I did. So let's import yes, this pass also, which I rendered as a 32 bit, I believe. Too. So I'm going to import it first. Yeah, it's a 32 bit, so I will use the exposure again. And the levels to make sure I'm, I'm optimizing the pass. Okay. And I'm, I'm using this uh, depth pass I did before. So I can um, use it now to optimize the value range in the foreground too. So I'm going to mask first the background. Okay. And now I want to optimize the values if possible. It's kind of weird. Magic ones, one doesn't work in 32 bit, I think, which is a bit annoying.
I'm trying to get a good a good um, a good gradient on on each part of the uh, of the image because I don't I don't want to have too much bending when I'll be in eight bits so I think we can call it good enough it's not perfect but it should avoid most of the bending issues. And I'm going to use it as a channel to just to have an idea so this way I, I'll be able to uh, quickly uh, emphasize the color temperature for example of the light versus the shadows or things like that but at the same time I don't want to lose too much of this uh, value transition so I'm not going to destroy the values right now I'm just going to keep it like that can remove this one. I did two metal passes just to see which one would be better. So I think I did one with the full rendering and, and one simplified. And uh, I will keep both just uh, for later. Okay, and now I'm going to import all of my texture passes. So my texture passes, I will import them into the local colors folder. And it's going to create some nice surprises at the end. I'm already smiling at the different patterns I'm seeing because some, some of them are, are really cool. Sorry for the noise outside. Okay. So, local colors. I'm going to create a sub group. Let's call it textures, like that. Paint over. So in this in this folder, I add some brush strokes by hand, and in this one, I'm going to be able to pick textures as I need them. Okay. So I think it's all well organized right now. I'm going to put another layer here. Let's call it uh, colors. Ooh, uh, color, uh, 
uh, yes, students. I change the names all the time. I'm trying to come with a name that makes sense for you. Just you know what I'm going to do in here. So let's call it local colors again. Okay. So here I'm going to use like adjustment layers and uh, and multiplies and other kind of fusion mode to obtain some colors I can't get only with with this current uh, color combination. So as you can see, it's really cool because I can, for example, have some local colors, and now I can add some metalness if I want, some reflection. And then by just changing the uh, the value ratio of the reflection, and maybe putting it on screen or on lighten only, I I'll be able to quickly create different kind of materials. So that I, I really prefer to do it that way, rather than messing around for hours into Keyshot to try to set up different materials. And uh, also, I think it's it's more illustrative that way because I, I can stylize the materials so they can really work for me and not trying to absolutely stick to uh, to the physics of the engine. Okay. Let's save it. So, most of the times, my files start to get. Uh, quickly huge in size. So I'm going to uh, save this into PSB already because I know that I'm going to hit the uh, two, uh, two gigs bit, two gigs mark, sorry. Uh, PSD are limited to uh, two gigs. So I'm going to save it as a PSB so I can go up to three, four gigs. But when I'm, I start to reach four gigs, I try to uh, flatten down layers. So this is why I love to, to keep different versions because right now this organization is really cool to, uh, to composite quickly everything around. But, but this is still a 8K file. So we, with all the layers and so on, it's going to be quite huge already. So just to uh, default, just to keep things um, fluid and having a, a, a nice workflow. Uh, when I, I start to have a nice base, which I'm happy with and I know I won't uh, change things too much, I, I will flatten everything and only keep my uh, my lighting and one layer of local colors and just one layer of, of lighting and so on. So this is also why I really love to uh, separate everything like that because it's it's easy afterward to just flatten this group and I have all my local colors that make sense, flatten my lighting and uh, yeah I can simplify the, the, the file and, and keep a manageable size quite quite easily. And at the very end, when, when I'll be happy with the uh, overall color mood and the overall uh, values and so on, I, I will flatten everything and I will keep just one or two version so I can start to really uh, have fun with the uh, manual paint over process. So, for some reason, I lost this one. Okay. I have a shortcut which is um, programmed in Photoshop that select me the layer or the group which is called flat and I can select my magic wand to quickly pick any part of the image. So this is something I, I was using uh, in comic book coloring 
just to quickly, uh, very quickly, and I have, I have some other labs here. I did not notice. Not big deal. And um, I started to use the same thing in 3D thanks to the uh, ID pass you can quickly make in any 3D software. And uh, it's, really, it's really handy. The, the main challenge in doing uh, illustration with 3D this way is to really get the composition and the main edges to be defined before you start to, to come in Photoshop. Exactly like you would do if you would uh, colorize a drawing, which is already done. It's very important because when you start to change your edges, at the same time, time that you are starting to colorize your 3D pass, it's, it starts to become quite difficult to manage and to keep a clean result. So this is why I, I try to really define my, my composition before I move into Photoshop. And I can, I can uh, always come back later in the process when all my colors will be defined and, and make dramatic changes. But before doing this, I want to really make sure I have a proper values and, and colors that are defined. So I'm going to select the water and I want to only keep this part of the water. So this is the uh, 2K render that I did because I'm going to uh, do quite a lot of painting on top of it, so it's not really important that I have uh, 8K definition for this part of the image. And I want to add some, um, some wetness to the fish and the uh, toad already. So let's see. I think I'm going to use this in an. I'm going to make a copy just in case. I'm going to clean some of the noise because it will be an issue at some point to have this noise in the render. So I'm going to use a nice filter for this, which is Topaz Clean. It does a really nice job at uh, cleaning all the noise and simplifying uh, the shapes. Well, actually it doesn't work that way. Well. For this in this instance so maybe I have to test something different okay cancel let's try another one maybe noise dust and scratches Not bad. I think it's better. It's definitely better. It's definitely better like that. And we haven't lost too much details. This one is cleaner, definitely cleaner, because this one was without the um, the full mode, the entire mode in Ablet, so there is less boons light indication, reflection of the of the light of the other surfaces, but at the same time it's cleaner. But let's see. So the thing is wetness, what what is difficult with wetness is it's a second layer transparent layer often that happen because of, of water 
on top of the initial uh, material. So it does reflect some of the energy. So it tends to uh, bring down the overall value of the local, of the local uh, color of the element. So I want to keep this, but at the same time, because it's transparent, sometimes it, it bounces only uh, the, uh, the, the uh, lighter values. It, it affects more the, uh, the lighter values than the darker values. So I'm going to do a combination of both. Maybe by having this one on uh, lighten. See if I can tweak the values a bit. Because light is all about and colors, it's all about energy. It's it's all about the, the quantity of energy that is going to to get back to your eyes. So a completely reflective material is going to ignore absolutely the local color of the object because it's going to reflect uh, based on your point of view the, uh, the opposite angle of the surface you are looking at and the, the, uh, the light from the opposite angle is going to bounce on the battery and, and come back to your eyes. So you won't be able to see at all the local color of the, of the object because you're only going to have the bonset light. And a perfect diffuse material is going to bounce so much light in, each, every, in every direction that you are going to only see the uh, local color of the object and you, you won't be able to see any, any fractions. And, and wetness is just in the middle because it's, it's a transparent layer that reflects part of the environment, but that also lets some of the energy pass through this layer and act at the diffuse material level. So this is why, what I'm trying to simulate by mixing a lighten and a normal. So with the normal, I'm, I'm starting to, to impact the, uh, the value a bit more. I'm lowering the, the overall value of the, of the diffuse layer. Let's see. I'm going to group this, invert the mask, and now I'm going to select roughly the part of the different materials that are wet. Just to have a rough idea. And I think it's too much on the frog, definitely. So I'm just going to paint a bit on the uh, on the fish and maybe on the tongue. And now I'm going to use another layer just for the for the eyes. Maybe some part of the fish too. 
which are going to be semi-transparent at the end. I'm going to play a bit with the transparency of the of the background of the uh, background elements just to suggest a bit of a scatter scattered light and things like that. It's really not that obvious because there is, there is no the, the grass. They don't uh, catch any uh, any strong element of reflection, so it's not extremely obvious. But I like some of the way it impacted the overall value, so I'm going to adjust a little bit of it. screen it does I feel that the uh, the told need to have a, str sl a slightly stronger indication of wetness on his on its skin. But I don't want either to bring too much details and start to and start this this uh, material indication to uh, bring too much noise on the surface. So there is balance, definitely balance to find. And right now it's it's just the lighting information, so I, I will be able to uh, completely change the, the local values and colors after a while. Ah oh, yeah, I'm constrained into that mask. So um, let's try with this one. I'm, I'm trying to decide if uh, I can bring any interesting suggestion on wetness on the rocks, but it's going to be way too strong. So this is something that, that I'm going to achieve at the I think raises the um, texture a little. Back up. So this is what we had without, with only the diffuse pass, the diffuse light pass, and uh, the matte material. And now with a bit of reflection of wetness. So now the thing is, if I'm starting to move into uh, this mode right now, it can be cool. 
I don't know. Sometimes I prefer to, to add a few local colors before anything, just to get an idea of, uh, of the rough values of things. Maybe I'll do this just to make sure. decide how I'm going to make each and every element to, to read, to stand out. Do I want a very dark shape here? Is it going to be a very dark? A very dark shape or a, a lighter one? So I'm, I'm trying to look mainly at the navigator window, at the, at the small window to decide about the, uh, the values. The thing is, with a light value, it might be more difficult to make this, uh, this fish look uh, aggressive. I was thinking of, some, of something uh, darker to begin with. But uh, I don't know. Okay. What I'm going to do before anything else, I'm going to add some depth. Because it's a bit difficult to, to read right now. So for the depth, it's a, it's a subtle mix. For me, depth is a subtle mix of of lowering the amount of energy that is received from the background, but also occluding uh, details in the, in the shadows, because the way atmospheric perspective works, and right now I'm going to exaggerate this a lot, but if you have ambient moisture of, of particles in, in the air, it's going to scatter the light that is coming from the, the uh, brightest part of the background. And when the light of the brightest spot, like for example this, this uh, light here, this shape which is little, it receives much more energy than the part which is in the shadow. So this energy is going to bounce into the direction, into every direction actually. But from how point of view, this light that is going to bounce, it's going to bounce around on each, each and every particle of moisture, of, of um, dust and scratches in the air, oxygen and so on. And in, it will start to slowly occlude any kind of details in the shadow area, because to be able to get the details in this area, we will need to have uh, a straight light ray that come to us and the thing is because the light from here is going to bounce in the in the atmosphere um, in every direction it will start to to lighten the uh, the uh, darker details that exist in here and to match them so it's, it's going to create an, an occluded so concretely in illustration this shape here will become a flat shape without details and this is what makes feel the, the depth and the other thing <clears throat> that happened with distance is a slightly shift a slight shift of colors toward um, another hue and uh, the thing is on earth with uh, with the oxygen in the atmosphere and so on uh, oxygen actually uh, diffract <coughs> more the higher part of the of the spectrum than the lower part of the spectrum. So what happened is that oxygen tends to diffract uh, the uh, the cold part of the light. And and by by doing so the local colors of the object they will travel through us, through these layers and layers of bounce light from the sun, which tend to, to
to diffract into the air in, into the form of a, of a cold light. So the local colors of the object will start to lighten when it comes to us because it's, it's going to go through this other uh, scattered light which is colder. So it's going to slightly move the hue toward a colder value and a lighter value toward a colder color, sorry, and a lighter value. So in Photoshop, the, the easy way to mimic this is to use the, to use the lighten layer because the, the lighten layer behave like pretty much the way uh, atmosphere works. But not completely because the, the second thing that happened is that there is a slight decrease in the amount of energy that is reaching us because even some of this energy that I mentioned here, which is born from this uh, grass blade here, because some of this energy is going to bounce in the atmosphere uh, through the, 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 uh, the different um, particles of light and the, and the oxygen and so on, we, we are going to lose a bit of the light. So usually what I do is that I am doing a combination of, of a normal layer to, to occlude a bit of the light and start to, to shift the color and lower the contrast. And on top of it, I'm going to use pretty much the same color, but in light on mode. <coughs> Most of the time, atmospheric perspective can really be, uh, I try to think of it on my side as design, and I try to design the, the way atmosphere impact the overall image on a per image basis. So I'm not going to use the exact same recipe in each uh, illustration, in each painting. Because uh, yeah, at the end, the goal is to tell a story. So most of the time I'm going to cheat and to, to make up uh, some elements of physics that don't necessarily exist. In, uh, in the physical world, but that I can, I can use to, to help me uh, in, the, in the purpose of separating elements and uh, helping the overall image to read. And it's, it's all very subtle anyway. So I don't want my main, um, my foreground element to be impacted by this. So I'm going to crush the values in the foreground a bit to make sure I have like 100% black. Right, so let's create another layer with a solid color. Maybe I want a greener, just to test a greener color. So what I'm going to do right away is to include my sky in this. Okay. And inside the frog itself, I'm going to need to tamper down this effect. Otherwise, it, it creates this odd, impossible uh, element. So, with my brush, and I'll start to paint inside the mouse to roughly have the same, uh, the same mask effect. Okay, so right now I'm going to cheat a lot 
going to stylize this, uh, this phenomenon. to create a temporary selection here with these two elements and now with the depth in quick selection mode I'm going to try to select only this bark and the main character just to isolate it from the background another one another adjustment again okay look good I want okay I'm going to save this selection again. Now I'm going to select my sky. I'm trying to get rid of this of this little noise. I got, I have to be careful about these little lines because right now they are very thin that they don't really matter, but at some point uh, after adjustment after adjustment they will start to create sort, some sort of line drawing around my shapes and uh, it's not something I want so but right now I think it's okay to think about how I'm going to clean this. Basically, I removed any part of this foreground, of this foreground from the equation, and I'm going to lower down my last move just to make this layer impact just a bit, but not too much. Okay, I'm going to use a gradient to. Uh, get rid of this shape here quick selection masks this part of the image so this way I can only impact what is underneath the towel okay let's see maybe I can go towards something greener because I really want to give the impression that there is a lot of, uh, of grasses around and this grass is going probably to catch a lot of uh, green, yellow green lights because of the um, subsurface scattering that is going to occur everyone, uh, everywhere around so I'm trying to think about that right now and uh, let's see about my background now so I will need maybe to handle my background separately I don't know Create it, maybe move it toward. I don't know. Uh, a warmer color, maybe a bit.
going to decide if I'm going to, to add some sort of gradient. Maybe more of a, of a color red gradient rather than a, a value one. I don't know. It's a bit strong right now, but uh, I will I will temper definitely temper this down later. Right now I just need to to have something to to compare the color choices and value choices I'm going to make in the foreground. So. I'm going to let this at 100% right now, just to, to have a stylized background and, and start to work on my, on my uh, foreground element colors. And I often start with really crazy exaggerated colors. It, it, it often helps me to uh, to get more interesting colors later, <clears throat> because after after that I'm going to try to fix the uh, the impossible colors that I, I decided for. So maybe for this frog, I'm going to try one of these textures because I think some of them was quite interesting, just as a base. That's sometimes difficult to make a choice because some of these textures are really, really nice, but uh, I don't want to get caught into the trap of, uh, of selecting colors just because a texture just because it, because it looks nice. I I still want to keep in mind my initial idea. Sometimes I, I get distracted by these nice textures. Okay, maybe let's try this one. Trying to see if I can if I can spot some nice color patterns at some places. This big yellow scare is, is really tempting. 
I'm really tempted, but in the meantime, I, see, I think it's going to be distracting. So I will try to avoid it for now. Yeah, I have some of the water. Okay. crazy bit. I try to make sense of them. Right now I'm trying to get a general feel of the color of the color skin of the color skin, sorry. And uh, the same way I, I did when I was sculpting, I, I try not to focus on what I see, but on the potential of the uh, of the of the language that exists inside the colors. For example, right now I'm thinking, okay, this this piece of pattern here is, is interesting, the way it flows in the direction of the fish. So I might be able to use this and inside that shapes, maybe this kind of scale-like pattern can also be interesting. I like these lines here on the nose. The, for me, the um, difficult balance to find is between the initial idea I have, which which is often not extremely original because uh, I tend to get distracted by the references I'm gathering. So I tend to see a reference and I, I say, oh, okay, this looks really cool. I really love this pattern on the on this toad and I want to have the same. But at the same time, I think it's, it it doesn't allow me to, make, to create something uh, I would say original, it's, it's kind of a, I, I would say not pretentious, but I think it, we never do anything original, but at least not overseen. And um, this is why I like to, to, to uh, try to be surprised by, uh, by these textures. I did before but in the same time I have to be careful to not be totally seduced by a, by a texture in such a way that I, I completely forget to to think about my composition and about my initial uh, idea my initial purpose so right now for example if I if I want to be honest with me I would say this is extremely noisy and uh, there is like a total lack of uh, of composition purpose in this uh, texture pass right now so i might change it completely but at least it's going to give me something to begin with and maybe i, I will be able to to see some part of this texture that i, I really like and uh, that would help me to make um, a more uh, strong statement later stronger statement. For example, I am thinking, okay, this, this shape is kind of cool right here. Maybe it's a bit strong, but I like the way it, um, it helped you with the jaw of the creature. 
So let's remove the depth for a second to see what I have without any kind of depth. And I will create a temporary mask on top of everything just to ignore the uh, impact of the depth on any foreground element so I can concentrate on the on how the texture is. Yeah, this one. Every, every each and every of these textures is really cool. So it's, it's really difficult to make a choice, I think. So for this texturing part of the process, I, I like to use extremely simple brushes, round brushes, hairbrush, chisel brushes. because I, I don't want any indication of, a, of, texture, of texture work, of brush work right now. Just want it to be as clean as possible. And honestly, it's, it's, it's going in a crazy direction right now. I'm not even sure I'm, I'll be able to exploit this because It's really messy. It's, it's a really messy texture. Yeah, this one is unusable and this one is way too dark. So I can see I still have some texture in the water here. Back up. Um, now, let's see what I can do with this fish. Ah, oh, yeah. This fish here, I will need to maybe have this on to overlay. This way, this layer is going to impact the underneath texture too. So I'll be able to make texture choices. See, this one, it already looks nice. Yeah, this one is cool. I think I'm going to make a first, a first pass with this one. And with my airbrush, I will try to just temper down some of these strong shapes. I don't want it to be too strong either, but just to have something to begin with. Yeah, I remember this one. I was thinking about the, the tongue. I think this one is going to to be quite interesting for, for this tongue and uh, I will, while I'm at it, I will add it to the tongue right away. And if, I, because I'm recording this over the course of several days, based on the time I have and so on. Uh, sometimes I forget why I did a specific pass, but most of the time when I'm doing a pass, I'm looking at specific spots, spots in the image. So I generally have a, a good idea at the moment when I'm deciding the pass about which part of the image it would be interesting to be, to be used. I think this one has some potential for the fish too, but the colors 
uh, long, so I'm going to make a copy, Ctrl G. And first, I'm going to do something more about this about this tongue because I, I really like the way this pattern here can help to read the uh, directionality of the shape. Just here. Okay, and now let's see what I can do with this fish. Maybe invert the colors or maybe shift them. The big question is what color does this fish will have? I don't know, it might be a trap because it's interesting visually, but there is too, no, too much uh, pixel, pixel, uh, pixel information. Because it was uh, this pass I did it with the, um, the matcap uh, mapping. But in, instead of changing the matcap, I, I kept it and I, I dropped another, another texture. So it kept the same mapping, but for the matcap, but with a new texture. And it, it creates this old squarish texture at some point. So let's see if I can find something else. Let's see. Maybe this can be interesting, just in here. It's really, as I, as I said before, that's really <clears throat> what I'm trying to do in my work is, is really to, in a way, art direct happy accident. So. I really try to create the conditions for happy accidents and just try to get surprised by by shapes, by colors, and, and decide if I want to keep them or not. Sometimes it does this, it's very annoying. Okay, good. So it was about, yeah, this one. So on this one, I spotted this part of the texture that I think could be interesting on the jaw. So I want to make a selection, no, sorry. In create a, an empty mask. try to emphasize just this part of the texture. 